All right, let's try that one again. Um, hello, everyone. And welcome to day two of the 2021 SOA annual conference. I am Adam Wancher, your new past president of SOA. Um, quick housekeeping notes. The session will end a little early at around 9.55 as Ben has another engagement, but there will be time after his um, presentation for some questions. And um, please make sure to fill out the session session, session survey um, that will be available at the end of the session and here in the chat. Um, but before uh, I introduce our plenary speaker, Ohio History Connection Deputy Executive Director and Chief Learning Officer Ben Garcia, I just wanted to say a few words. Um, first, a big thank you to the Educational Planning Committee for the great job they have done putting the conference together. Without them, the work they do um, and the work they do, this wouldn't be possible. If you would like to st uh, to play a part in SOA's 2022 annual conference, um, please consider joining the EPC. I'd also like to thank SOA Council and all SOA members. It has been an honor to serve as president of this fine group for the past year and a half. It has certainly been an interesting and tumultuous time. As we move forward, inching hopefully closer out of the pandemic, there's still so much for us to consider and reckon with. Yesterday, Karen made two very salient points amongst many that I'd like to repeat. They mentioned that not all change has to be big and even small efforts towards change matter. I think this is something we should keep in mind as we look towards tackling problems with both large and small. They also mentioned making sure you have the mental and physical capacity for the work you're about to undertake. Too often I think we neglect to truly care for ourselves. The last year plus has been very stressful and hard for so many for shared reasons and so many individual ones as well. Please try, if you can, to take time for yourself and look out for one another. As SOA President Sherry mentioned, we should focus on putting people over paper while doing our work. We must also remember that we are people too. So thank you again. Now, on to the introduction of our plenary speaker, Ben Garcia. Ben Garcia is the Deputy Executive Director and Chief Learning Officer at The Ohio History Connection. There he leads special projects and oversees six divisions. Prior museum experience includes tenures at the J. Paul Getty Museum, the Skirball Cultural Center, the Phoebe A. Hearst Museum of Anthropology at UC Berkeley, and the Museum of Us. Ben serves on the boards of Equity Ohio and the Association of Midwestern Museums. The floor is now yours, Ben. Thank you so much, Adam, for that introduction. Um, hi, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here with you all today. I will be uh, reading my plenary a little more than speaking it. I um, apologize for not uh, having taken enough time to really commit it more to memory, which is my preference. But this is one of four panels that I'm doing because at the same time as your annual meeting, we are doing the uh, American Alliance of Museums annual meeting. Um, this week as well. So I'm just so glad to have this time with you all and um, to present this plenary, Archives, Libraries, Museums, Meaning, Ma Meaning Making and Magic. So thank you for having me. I'd like to thank uh, Rachel Bussert and Bill Madro and also Adam for inviting me to give today's plenary address. And to my colleagues at the Ohio History Connection, Fred Previtz and Elizabeth Woods, who know far more than I about archives and libraries and who offered counsel as I prepared. I'd like to say that I considered myself and the whole state of Ohio actually, lucky to have them and the rest of my colleagues on the library and archives teams as stewards of the state archives and the History Connection archival collections and library. Today's plenary will begin as a meander through the wildwood of our vocation before transitioning to some thoughts on equity and inclusion, the topic I was asked to address. Elizabeth told me to stick with what I know, and I've done that to a truly self-indulgent degree. I use the term vocation because being an archivist, like being a museum worker or a librarian, is a calling. At some point, we all fell in love with the mysteries and stories that are encased and coded within the items and histories we tend. And after a rough year, I felt like reconnecting with that. And I hope this talk reconnects you too. So relax and join me on the meander. My talk takes about 35 minutes and then we'll have about 10 minutes or so to respond uh, 
for you to respond or to ask any questions. The dead are alive to me and always have been. At six years old, I remember playing in a budding graveyards in the town where we lived, headstones crooked and moss covered, encircled and subsumed in places by wild blackberry, buckling with age. They were situated between two churches, spilling down a gentle slope bisected by a narrow gravel road where they switched from holding the dead of one denomination to those of the other. That was lost on me then, and I imagine lost on the dead who have entered a different communion and who pass freely from their places of rest to visit with one another, who come and go as they please, unencumbered by the allegiances that cost the living so dearly. I was allowed to explore on my own every Sunday when the weather cooperated, seemingly for hours, likely for considerably less, while my parents visited with friends after church and my siblings spread out across our small town to meet up with playmates and adventures of their own. I headed into those liminal grounds. My friends awaited me at the bottom of the cemetery where a row of small mausoleums set within wrought iron fences stood against an ancient shaded brick wall. Like the thoroughfare of a once grand city, overgrown and faded in miniature. These small mansions, as I imagined them to be, were scaled perfectly for me. And I whiled away hours playing house and speaking with the neighbors, passing in and out of small rusted gates that squealed and croaked, unused as they were to the touch of living flesh. I felt accompanied and comfortably surrounded by a community of beings. I didn't speak about these companions long deceased as they weren't remarkable to me, no more remarkable than the living who I passed on the street as I walked with my mother or siblings to the bookstore or grocer. We moved from that town to another, an ocean away. This one was perched on a sound, estuaries encroached, lined with reeds perfect for trapping minnows. Rocky promontories gave way to tidal flats and troves of tide pools. My hands were always wet and briny. An Olmsted park skirted the shore, bookended by gazebos <clears throat> with diminutive stone ramparts placed picturesquely, looking out at the expanse of flat water. And one fairy tale tower set into a hollow against copses of larch and elm and oak. No burials in the churchyards there, and so my playmates were the wee folk, or so I believed. I had long conversations with them as I explored the woods and buried pennies in turf-covered hordes that I marked with twigs, only to lose track of them, or pulled snails off the sides of tide pool walls, clinging fast and then releasing with a soft, wet pop. I lived in a large, square stucco house formerly a convent, with my parents, six siblings, and a dog. We bought it from the Catholic Church. The former chapel was our playroom. A rectangle of carpet had been removed from the raised platform, marking the spot where the altar once stood. Our ping pong table covered it. We were a temperamental crew and easily distracted, strongly opinionated, and rarely convinced by another's position. Tended toward messiness, Half-drunk cups of tea or coffee were scattered about, sometimes with one of my mother's cigarette butts floating inside. Half-read newspapers, too. No sentence was completed before others stacked onto it. There was always an argument in progress, always someone in the spot you hoped to be. It could be competitive and volatile, and when anger flashed through the chaos like a sudden thunderstorm, frightening. It was rarely quiet. At the age of nine, I had two options for seeking peace, two places to go to get out of the line of fire, outdoors to that park or the estuary in their myriad ecosystems where I could exercise my imagination and chase after ethereal companions, or indoors to the local library. From the ages of seven to 12, I walked to the library after school almost every day and spent two hours curled up on a squashy blue sofa in the children's room that smelled faintly of disinfectant and aging paper. 
immersed in worlds of gnomes and fairies, of magical courts where children could get trapped, of magical orchards of golden fruit, the Oz books and Narnia, Earthsea and Middle Earth, E. Nesbitt and Burgess, and fairy tale anthologies published in the 1930s. The dead were alive to me, and thanks to these books, so were the fae. These worlds of imagination were as real to me as the physical world I inhabited, more so in some ways, as I ventured out. On weekends, my mother would regularly banish us and tell us not to return to the house before 5 p.m. I passed between realms, losing time, occasionally ensnaring my younger brother or a playmate in the story, convincing them that magic was real in those places where nature had free reign. The empty lot across the street where the foundation of a long gone house could still be discerned within the tall grass and towering weeds. The maze of narrow paths through the reeds by the salt flats that led to clearings created by the high school kids. The detritus of adolescence left behind, but perfect for disappearing for hours. The small ocean rock caverns beneath the rocky overhang at water's edge. To me, these were the entrances to the underworld, the fairy realms, the enchanted forest. My brother or that rare playmate would be drawn in for a while, their curiosity piqued by the possibility, but then their interest would fly. Some other activity, more tangible, more physical, less odd, would call them. I never grew out of it this understanding of the world as a plane of reality intersecting in places with others, the spirit realm, the magical realms, the realms of non-rational, unobservable, intuitive knowing. I never grew out of it, not as a teen, not in college, not as a young man, and not today. My imagination only expanded as I encountered new worlds in literature and art and moved from town to town finding new spots, new spaces, where the energies of something else, something hidden could be felt. Objects and places had animating energies, of course. The books on the sofa taught me this, and so too did our church, where I learned that God's spirit could inhabit a fragment of wood or a saint's bone or a natural element like a spring. In fourth grade, our teacher, Miss Rogers, took us on a field trip to the American Museum of Natural History in New York. It was November, and at the planetarium, we beheld the night sky in Bethlehem 2,000 years before. The narrator took us on the journey of the Magi as they followed the star to that stable, while pointing out the convergence of planets that made the star so bright. Reclining in my seat in a darkened room, listening to the Christmas story told through astronomy and watching the night sky, I felt more than I remember ever feeling before. My heart filled my chest and pressed against my ribs. Christmas songs played, the projector twirled and bobbed. Walking out unsteadily into the light and the sounds of hundreds of kids who were visiting the museum that day, sneakers squeaking on the terrazzo floors, sound bouncing off the marble clad walls. We followed Ms. Rogers in a double line. She clicked briskly ahead of us, auburn hair bouncing. At the bottom of the stairs, she stopped and the group of us waited as bodies swirled around us while she freshened her lipstick, a dark wine red, looking critically into the mirror of her compact before leading us up the stairs across the hall of ocean life and into another darkened landscape. The gem room at the American Museum of Natural History was a series of octagonal galleries set around a cavernous multi-level central space consisting of multiple stepped viewing areas. It took a minute for my eyes to adjust to the dark and to take it all in. The entire room was carpeted, floors of course, but also walls and ceiling damping the sound and erasing the distinction between the surfaces for walking leaning, sitting, and laying. Each gallery featured a different species of gem, flashing barrels and corundums, luminescent opals, and at the end, at the center of each viewing area was a pedestal 
topped with a gem or mineral of particular distinction. The galleries and viewing areas were connected by a series of ramps. Each gem had a pinpoint of light aimed at it so that they glowed in the space like the constellations in the planetarium. The only other lights were placed at the bottom of the wall to softly illuminate the edge of the ramps. The sensation I felt in the gem room, surrounded by literal treasure, into what, in what to my mind was the apotheosis of interior design, was my homecoming. This was my house. This was where I wanted to live. And some part of me lives there still. My parents met when they were nine years old, attending the same school in Buenos Aires. My dad was the son of a Colombian American couple who were living there temporarily. He moved to the US at 17 to finish high school and attend college. And my mother immigrated with her mother and sister at the age of 22. They were married in Greenwich Village in 1954. We moved around a lot, but lived for a long stretch in a suburb of New York City. Sometimes I wished my mother would make meatloaf for dinner or jello and that we could buy sofas that matched like at our neighbor's houses. But I believed that my parents would be bewildered in the face of such desires. I became withdrawn and quiet as I worked to hide my foreignness from my schoolmates and my desire for conformity from my parents. As I aged into adolescence, the other secret I was keeping from both was my queerness. I lived in a world that did not seem as real as the one I occupied in my imagination. I continued to seek worlds where those realities would converge. For me, that turned out to be museums. I was 14 and stood on the platform on a cold gray morning and buried my chin into the upturned collar of the long charcoal wood coat that I had bought at the secondhand store. I was warm in the coat and proud that it was an adult's coat and not the padded down jacket of a kid. A light rain prickled my cheeks and forehead as I waited for the train. I felt free and grown up. I breathed the chilled, wet air in deeply and felt my insides expand as I contemplated my first trip into the city alone. My mother had told me about the museum that I was going to visit. She said it was one of the most beautiful museums in New York. And something about the way she had spoken of this place made me look particularly forward to seeing. I got off the train at Grand Central Station and for the first time was able to spend as long as I wanted looking around the Great Hall and up at the vast painting of the constellations on the seal. I had been through this station many times, but always with my father and always in a hurry. Grand Central Station's hall occupied my mind that day as I made my way uptown on the bus and then down 70th Street on foot, leading into the wind that whipped up my coat. It was in this state of pleasant concentration that I first saw the Frick Museum. As soon as I realized that this was my destination, I was besotted. A doorman opened the door for me and I experienced a rush of warmth upon checking my coat and embarking down the hallway that led to the former drawing room. I passed the grand staircase tantalizingly cordoned off and began to imagine myself as the owner of this house. The other visitors faded away and I walked into a room where I was shaken from this reverie by a familiar face. It was Thomas More. I knew it as soon as I saw the painting next to the fireplace. I recognized this image from my history book of the year before. And now here was the painting in front of me. I even knew who had painted it. For some reason, I remembered the name Holbein from the caption on that book. I was excited and a little bewildered. I didn't know that I knew this, but here I was and I did. It was the first time I recognized a painting in a museum. It was the first time that I knew something about a painting that didn't come from a label or an adult. I looked around for someone to make eye contact with, for someone who was also experiencing this great moment and realized that it was my moment alone. I knew something about this painting that maybe no one else in that room knew. My body relaxed. I happily breathed in the aroma of wood polish and dry warmth of a central heating system that was no doubt set too high for the good of these artworks. I felt smart and competent and confident as I moved on and turned the corner into the former dining room. 
There on the velvet covered walls of the long gallery, I was stopped in my tracks by two portraits of young men, probably about my age, created by the late Renaissance artists Bronzino and Pontorma. These beautiful, arrogant boys painted in saturated, acidic color exuded a confident sexuality that took my breath away. I believe that if I looked at these pictures for too long, everyone around me would realize how I was responding to these works. But although I was embarrassed by my attraction to the sitters in these portraits, I couldn't move on. I literally could not tear myself away. Like a love-struck Pygmalion, I spent the better part of my visit circling back to get more time with these two young noblemen. On the train home, forehead resting on the cool glass of the window, I looked out at the splattering rain and lowering clouds as the high rises gave way to industrial parks and then to neighborhoods of small houses pressed together. Utility poles flickered by and the rhythm and motion of the train lulled me into wistful contemplation of the lives of those who lived in the places we were passing. I knew nothing about them, but the prognosis in my imagination was not great. Wrapping myself in the remembered smell of wood paneling and the viridescent glow on the face of the young noble in the green velvet doublet, I planned my next outing to the city. At, at age 32, I got my first museum job when my now husband and I moved to Los Angeles from Boston, and it stuck. I found work where knowing how to conjure liminal spaces and alternate worlds is an asset, where imagination and wonder are necessary for success, work where my relationship with the dead serves them and their descendants, archives, libraries, and museums at their best, as I experienced so viscerally at nine and 14, are portals. Spaces where story, spirit, art, science, and magic converge. Port keys that fling you into places unexpected. Lois Silverman, who writes about museums and transcendence, defined museum magic as elusive moments of insight, transformation, and deep significance that helps us to see the purpose and reasons for living. It is those moments that I aspire to enable as the leader of a history and preservation organization for children and adults, too many of whom have not seen themselves represented, respected, acknowledged, named in our museums and historic sites and in our archives and reading rooms. So they too can continue to hold the possibility of real magic and find it in their own corners of the world. Over the past 20 years, I've moved from being subject to the decisions and structures of the museums where I worked to having greater ability to determine them. The reason I chose to move away from creating programs and exhibits and into administrative roles was a version of being the change I wanted to see in the world. I noted from the various perches I occupied in several museums that disempowerment, inequity, and hypocrisy were too common in their workplace cultures and could be traced in part to their man management structures and values. Certainly individuals were sometimes the issue, but organizational structure enabled and even encouraged the dehumanizing and othering practices that led to abuse. I was recently directed to the Change the Museum Instagram account at Change the Museum and scrolling through it is a journey into abusive relationships. In most cases, the organization or a segment of the leadership is the perpetrator. The focus in this case are instances of racism experienced by staff who post their experiences anonymously. In my experience, similar stories addressing gender, queerness, disability, and economic biases could fill other accounts. And I suspect that the situation is not very different in the field of archives. Our fields, like many others, are reckoning, reckoning with and recognizing the disparities and assumptions that were sewn into them from their inception during the age of exploration and industrial expansion. 
Every age had its champions for equity and inclusion, and every age had its understanding of what those concepts meant. Today, the roles of systemic racism and colonization in the formation of museums, libraries, and archives, their contemporary practices, and workplace cultures has risen to prominence in our internal conversations. I hope we're at a tipping point. Time will tell if the recent focus on more inclusive practices in many museums and archives is part of a flare-up, time-limited and ignited by the larger context of racial justice advocacy in our communities. I'm hopeful that we are in the early phases of a new period where inclusive leaders at all levels of our institutions and those working in related areas are actually repairing and resetting museums and archives so that they can model the values and practices required for humans and all beings to prosper. At the Ohio History Connection, finding ways to address equity and inclusion that are nonpartisan is important given our status as a quasi-state entity. In my interview process, a senior staff person said to me that there is a right way to talk about equity and inclusion in Ohio. He recommended that I not use the language of academia for this work and instead talk about equity in plain language and frame inclusion as including people who should have been part of the decision-making all along, but have not been. I've taken that advice to heart. I'm a pretty pragmatic leader around this work and I want to see it move forward. I'm okay if I need to avoid using a particular term, whether that term is critical race theory, decolonization, white supremacy. As long as we can make changes in the areas that these terms were created to describe, because I moved, because I moved to Ohio from California, because my name is Garcia, because of the work that I've done, there may be assumptions that my new colleagues or community have about me. I'm aware that some think that I move a little too quickly, or that, some, or that I sometimes approach things in a way that works for California, but doesn't work for Ohio. I spend a lot of time working to demonstrate that I'm not going to undermine our success with a pace that's too fast, but rather that I'm here to celebrate the strengths of Ohio's particular qualities, and that I respect the Ohio way. One thing about this work, is that if you have a really clear understanding of the change you want to affect, being flexible about how to manifest that change is going to serve you. This is especially true if you're more invested in seeing the change happen than you are in proving a point. One of the first concepts you learn as an educator is that you meet people where they are. If you think about Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed, the way people learn most effectively is by starting with the context in which they live. The way Freire taught adults to become literate in weeks was by basing the language and lessons of literacy around their professional and lived contexts. I think the rate at which you make change is directly connected to your ability as an organization or as an individual to meet someone where they are and help them recognize a new opportunity from where they started about showing, not telling. You have to model the way forward. No one wants to be told what they should do. Generally, I think that if 10% of the people you're moving think you're moving too fast, and 10% think you're not going nearly fast enough, then you're going about the right pace. When those percentages really shift, when 50% of people think you're moving too fast or too slow, that's when you really need to take a hard look. It helps me to remember that institutions aren't inclusive and institutions aren't equitable. People are those things. Institutions are only as inclusive as the people who run them. Inclusion is a practice of individuals and our museums, libraries and archives reflect the cultures of the people who staff them. Yesterday, I presented on a panel at the American Alliance of Museums annual meeting with my colleagues, Cinnamon Catlin Agutko, director of the Illinois State Museum, Kaylee Bryant Greenwell, head of public programs for the Smithsonian American Art Museum, and Chris Taylor, chief inclusion officer for the state of Minnesota. My fellow panelists and I developed a list of tips for our audience 
for how to create a more inclusive, for how to create more inclusive museums. I think many will apply for archives as well. And I'm gonna share five for your consideration. I'm just gonna switch and share my screen so that you can see it as I go along. Hold on one second. Right. All right, so here we go. Know your institutional, oops, here we go. Know your institutional history, research it, document it, share it, talk about it. Preferably have an outside scholar write a critical history of your archive. Understand that while you may be newer to your role, your institution has a history of oppression and harm. You inherited this when you took a job there. It doesn't disappear and it's not forgotten by the victims. It's part of your job to tend to the harm caused and prevent future harm. You can't say that was before my time and I'm not responsible for it. Leaders, consider your power. It enters the room before you do and flavors everything that happens next. If you're white, how will you decenter yourself and name the power? Take a risk and be transparent about your inclusion journey. Own what you know and recognize what you don't. It's critical for your colleagues to understand that you are actively working to shrink your blind spots and build your inclusion skills. Equity and inclusion need a budget line, multiple lines. Something is not a priority if it's not in the budget. No matter your resources, you can start somewhere with these investments. Resource workplace culture. You will need a consultant who can work with your organization on a plan for developing an inclusive anti-racist organization and to help implement it. Your current staff and trustees should not and usually cannot take this on. Resource a recruiter, depending on your size in-house or use a consultant. The work of identifying BIPOC candidates and white allies and accomplices to bring onto your team, take strategy that will differ from job to job and real time to implement. Your hiring managers and HR professionals will not have time to do this. Pay equity is a foundational equity issue and implicates equity across a whole number of aspects of identity. Ensure that a supervisor doesn't earn more than 33% more than their lowest paid direct report. Ensure that the highest earner in your organization doesn't earn more than five to seven times the wage of the lowest earner. You can work incrementally to narrow the differential between the highest and lowest earners in your organization. And by making this a transparent value for your organization, you will attract candidates who care about economic equity. When issues of injustice are highlighted within your museum, either by staff or external voices, acknowledgement of the issues is only the first step. Move beyond acknowledgement to intentionality by articulating a plan to address the issue or create change. The dead are alive to me and so too the Fae. Spirit is real and takes more forms than I could have ever imagined. Despite the noise and chaos that surrounds us and the thunderstorms that frighten us, the evidence of magic, of something wonder-filled, clings like a mist to the corners and hollows of our landscapes. Cemeteries, tide pools, libraries, train stations, archives, libraries, and museums too bustle with spirits and the forces of life and healing and hope. Aren't we lucky to be charged with stewarding them? And how can we not do anything it takes, anything, to ensure that others can find their way in? Thanks so much. That's the end of my prepared remarks. And so let's um, turn things over for questions, responses, anything you'd like to hear.
and I will pop those five tips into the chat for folks in the meantime. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, so we do have one question. Can you see it in the Q&A? Yes. I can read it aloud too, if you want. Uh, I'll read it aloud. I want to commend you. Thank you. Um, I found myself struggling at times being my own advocate as a disabled librarian in Ohio, trying to get my first job in the field that I love. Any advice on continuing to be the change? I think that, you know, this gets to the larger question about how can we be the change from wherever we're situated in our career path, um, whether that is um, at the very entrance point, um, trying to enter the field or mid-career or, or onward. So, um, you know, first thing I'd like to say is that understanding why you're doing the work, um, staying connected with the passion that connected you to libraries in the first place, really knowing each morning why you're waking up and who you're waking up to sort of go out and advocate for is has been really important for me because there are definitely ups and downs. I think when you're um, living with disabilities, you are experiencing a whole raft of microaggressions and barriers to, um, to just being able to participate uh, in the workforce. And all of our organizations really need to be thinking about how we're lowering barriers around around access um, and ability. Um, I think that being the change looks different at different times. Uh, at, in, it looks different depending on where we're situated. I know that there are certain kinds of change that can only be made if your title is executive director or president of the board of trustees. Um, but whatever your sphere of influence is, you can begin to sort of to model that change in that space. So if you are the head of a small department, if you are um, a staff person who doesn't have direct reports, um, starting these conversations, uh, beginning to use different language, um, raising questions and concerns on behalf of those who don't have a voice, even in the space that you're in, as disempowered as you might feel, you actually have more access um, than a whole bunch of people uh, who are not in your situation. And so sometimes remembering that is helpful as well. Um, so I think just continuing to talk about it, continuing to try to impact your sphere of influence is what we can do. And, uh, you know, and I do recommend, you know, I think there's so many of us who just love the engagement, the direct engagement with our audience or our stakeholders. And it's hard to imagine moving into the more administrative realms as you sort of get further and further away. Um, but I just say that if equity and um, in all of its forms is something that drives you um, out of a love for your field, consider stepping into roles where you have greater administrative responsibility and less direct contact with the, with the thing that brought you into the organization in the first place. Most of us didn't enter our fields because we wanted to be managers or supervisors. Um, but it's really important that our managers and supervisors and leaders are people who are infused with a real passion for equity um, and who can see the internal work culture and the staff and, and your colleagues as your new audience. So um, those are some things that, uh, that I hope are helpful. You know, in terms of your um, specific situation, uh, you know, I wish you all the best. And, um, and I think for everyone, I'm happy to connect one-on-one -on -one to, I don't know, review resumes, talk about career path, or talk about any specific issues. So I'll pop my um, email address in the chat. Uh, next question, do you have any literature or recommended list of books to begin the discussion of inclusion and allyship within archival, archival museum repositories? Um, that is a 
Great question. The answer is absolutely yes. Um, I do have a bibliography that I can shell that I can share. And Adam, would that be something that would be good for me to send to Rachel and Bill? Do you think so that could be sent out as a follow up? Yeah. We can send out. We can send, share it with the whole listserv so people who didn't attend could also have access to it. So yeah. Absolutely. So I'll go ahead and do that. I apologize for not having it with me, but yes, absolutely. Uh, a bibliography that looks at many different aspects of equity um, in nonprofits that, that can be helpful. All right. If anyone has a question, please put it in the Q and A. Um, I have a question for you, Ben. Yeah. Talking about you, you talked about how you are making changes at OHC and how you've gotten some pushback. I was wondering not so much the culture of the pandemic, but it has the pandemic because of the shift in workflows, has it made it easier to implement that change? Has it made it more difficult? Is it just another hurdle that has to be, you know, you have to readjust your plan? I was just curious about that. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a really interesting question for me to think about. Um, I would say that uh, at the Ohio History of the Connection, the pandemic, forced us to, I think like many organizations, to pivot to ways of working and ways of thinking that have been a long time coming for our field, um, that there were other industries that were already more comfortable with a lot of um, uh, the strategies that were required um, in the pandemic. And so in that way, yes, because we've been, we were in such a wholesale moment of reevaluation, um, you know, we decided to do a strategic planning process and we uh, included the staff and the trustees in that. And the three strategic priorities for the organization are sustainability, equity, and relationship building coming out of that. And I do think that in some ways the pandemic and in some ways the context of um, protests and demonstrations for racial justice really helped our organization understand that um, this was a moment to, as long as we were doing such a wholesale, wholesale reevaluation of all the ways in which we were working, um, it made sense for this to be part of that mix as well. Thank you. Um, no other questions. So I'll just ask one more while I have you. Um, sort of related to this, you talked about how your experience with museums and libraries and whatnot as a as an adolescent, um, just curious myself, but now with this so much focus on, from social media and just entertainment companies in general on like the attention economy, how do we as libraries, archives, museums, um, memory institutions compete with those or should we be trying to compete with those? Is that something we should even be thinking about? Because obviously everyone's focused on getting their share of everyone's individual attention. Yeah, so um, I think that's, I think that, you know, sort of the, the, that language, I think we all need to be sort of a part of the work together, right? And so, um, you know, I'm, I've been thinking a lot lately about sort of what are those values that seem invisible um, to us as organizations, nonprofits, or, or you know, uh, especially, and I think that so many of those values come from uh, enterprise, private enterprise, and the for-profit realm. And those are spaces where competition is a really important value, and where um, you know, generation of profit is the goal, as opposed to us, where the generation of public value is the goal. And I think we really need to be doing all nonprofits. Um, archives, museums, libraries, and, and others, we really need to be examining the assumptions that we're working under because those assumptions for how we should work and how we should think about a concept like competition come from a different sector where that's maybe more valuable, but it's not valuable in nonprofits. Um, you know, we, we, were, we're, we exist as a counterbalance to, to the private sector and we do something different. So um, I do think that, uh, you know, that this is just something we, we need to be taking on all together and just understanding that, um, yeah, I guess that, that's that. 
Um, we do have another question for you. Yeah. Let's see here. How do you see the vocation of museum library archives work interacting with the problems caused by vocational awe? Um, expecting that we don't do this for the money, et cetera. Yes, I think that is, you know, I think that's a really great question. Um, we, you know, we are that, I love that term. I'd never heard vocational awe. And I think that absolutely describes the reason that most of us came in. So many of us felt just so lucky and so excited to to get a job in these in these spaces that mean so much to us. Um, and because of the roots of our organizations where generally um, institutions like ours were staffed by people who already were coming from families of means and generational wealth, um, compensation um, in many of our fields was not, uh, you know, certainly museums um, and I think you know, it, it's tr true also um, uh, with, with archives and libraries. Uh, compensation was not really something that was considered that, 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 you, that you should talk about. In fact, it was often, you know, I mean, we have a value generally as a culture to not talk about compensation. Um, there's always that point when you're applying for a job where you wonder, when should I ask how much this pays? Because there's a certain point at which if you're not coming from a uh, family that has generational wealth where you really have to understand, can you, how many jobs are you gonna have to work in order to take this job or, you know, can you afford to? So um, for organizations to move from living wage to a, mi a minimum thriving wage is really important in our field. And, you know, pay equity is an, an absolute top three issue that we're looking at in the organization. As I said in the talk, it impacts equity in all areas. The only way we're going to bring the perspectives and voices that have been missing into our organizations is if we can ensure that they will be able to have economic security. Um, and, you know, we are no longer a field that is run by people, you know, almost exclusively by people of means. And so we need to know that we're going to be. Um, to, you know, that we're going to have some means to take care of ourselves once we're at the other end of our career as well. So um, looking at what that path is, you know, a lot of that is about sort of shrinking down compensation at the high end because the ways in which um, executive directors are compensated in the non nonprofit world reflects the values of the for-profit world because many of our trustees come from for-profit and, you know, enterprise spaces. So they don't think it's unusual. And in fact, they think it's necessary for the leadership to be paid, you know, seven, 10, 12 times the amount of the lowest paid person. Um, we really need to be revisiting that and examining, you know, first of all, that assumption isn't great in the for-profit sector, but since that's not my sector, all I can speak to is that in a, in a sector that is about creating public value you have to walk your talk around those values and you have to make sure that you don't have someone who has a completely different economic possibility than, you know, than, than other people in the organization. Everyone should have a minimum thriving wage. And that means that they can live working one full-time job and support their, their, the basic needs of their family. Um, and, you know, for a market like Central Ohio, that starts at somewhere around $20 an hour. So, um, you know, I think that really thinking about, you know, and so if, if the lowest paid person is going to be making 20, the highest probably should be making much more than, you know, 100, 100 and, 40 an hour is at the absolute, you know, highest end, right? I mean, when you think about that, what that means in terms of an annual salary, that's a very comfortable living, right? Um, so I think these are things that we need to be talking about more. And um, that vocational awe has been one of the biggest benefits to leadership um, because most people don't push not even hard enough, don't push at all against what they're being compensated um, because there's just a sense that this is a nonprofit sector. That's not we're in it, what we're in it for. 
And so, you know, of course I should work a second job or a third job rather than just see how we could do something different where I am. Well said, Ben, thank you uh, so very much for joining us today. Um, I found that very impactful, the narrative of everything. So thank you very much. Um, we appreciate you being with us. So um, I think we'll let you go now so you can get to your next session. Um, All right, well, thank you for having me, Adam. I really appreciate it. And, um, you know, I just wanna say, you know, we're working toward these um, goals at the Ohio History Connection. We're a far, far away you know, we're far off from them. Um, our minimum compensation isn't near $20 an hour yet. And, you know, um, I think all of us in the leadership are thinking about how do we incrementally, Adam, to your point, it's like, these are about small moves. And so, you know, and transparency. So first and foremost, the team needs to know that that's your goal and that you're thinking about their economic um, security and and second of all like help them see this is going to take five years it's going to take seven years it's going to take 10 years but we're going to every year bite off a piece of this so that we can get to that place so. thank you and um thank you everyone for attending um i think the next session is betsy what time is it is that um 10 30. see you back at 10 30 for Amplifying Diverse Voices, Documenting the History of Underrepresented Communities at Two Ohio Universities. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.